Our theme for 2017, 1 Timothy 1.15, the saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. But this morning, about written that you may believe from that passage, John wrote his gospel and tells us in those couple of verses that he wrote it very specifically with three purposes in mind. And that when we read it, we can believe. Now, there are multitudes of books and, and more coming out every year of, about and people's opinions about the Bible, the, the, his, the historical accuracy of the Bible, the, the relevance of the Bible. There's, there's, you know, I don't know, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of authors who've written something about the Bible. But none of them are the Bible, and none of them are the written Word of God. Now, we have it translated from, originally it written in Greek and Hebrew by the prophets and Aramaic, parts of it. Um, but as it's translated into our English language, um, we are able to read what God told His apostles and prophets to write down. And we've talked a little bit recently, I think uh, our last Sunday evening when I was talking about uh, proclaiming Jesus, about teaching the Bible to people, that the Bible has within it its own sense of, I don't know what the right word is, but uh, uh, of power, of it, the more I have studied it and read it, in the last three decades, the more I am impressed by it not coming from human thought. And the Bible itself is the best thing at helping us to understand God. That's what he told us all through January. I was talking about the Second Timothy 3, 16 and 17, that all scriptures have been written to teach us about God's teachings and about God himself, about what's right, about what's wrong, and to help train us to be people who walk like God would walk. That's its purpose. In some sense, fairly simple, and yet it's very deep. It's very tough to actually fulfill all of that. But here in the Gospel of John, he gave us a, you know, a, a, his letter written to all the world and really said, I wrote these things so that when you read what I have written here, you could believe it. Now, why could we believe it? Well, one, John, even though he does not put himself in any scenario by his use of language in the letter, we know he was there. He was an eyewitness to everything. He saw it. He touched it. He heard it. He felt it. And an eyewitness account of events is, is far more uh, telling. We understand that. Human beings say, you know, we, we don't want to take evidence from a secondary account, do we? we? We want an eyewitness. That's somebody who can actually testify in a case. And that's what the Gospel of John is, as is much of the other writings of, uh, throughout the Bible. Many of them are eyewitnesses of the events and the things that God had given them. But he wrote these things that we may believe with a, he says, a singular goal. And that is that in believing you will have life in his name. Now, that for people who love life, who love getting up, seeing the sun, that's a wonderful thing. But you know, and we've talked a little bit about, we have people kind of shut in who are suffering regularly. Sometimes people who are suffering regularly, the idea of life never ending is actually a tough thing because their life experience is, I don't want this to continue forever. Well, but that's what he is telling us is what we experience in this world is not what will continue forever, but a life, even what he would like us to have in this world is a life that is abundant, that is full of joy and peace, and patience, and kindness, and He teaches us about how to do those things. 
But he is looking very much long term that he wants us to have a life filled with joy and love and peace. And he wants, and he is saying that when you're with me, you will have it. Now, we can also have it here because he is with us, though that's more difficult. We can't see him and touch him, right? Of course, when we leave this earth, when we get to actually see him face to face, see him as he is, that we will become like he is. John also writes for us in 1 John. But he writes this, and everything that's been written, as he said in the, in the passage, there's a lot more he could have written. What he wrote were God's words to say, if you read this, you can have faith and confidence in me. So he tells us he did a lot of other things other than what's written down in the presence of his disciples. So the disciples themselves saw and witnessed a great deal more, which aren't written in these books. But these were written so that we can believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in His name. The three reasons. Believe He is the Christ means, that word, Greek word, means Savior. And it actually is the word the Hebrews used in Greek, meaning Messiah. And so, He's telling us that He is the Savior of the world. He is the Messiah of the Jews. And he tells us that he also wants us to believe Jesus is the Son of God. By the way, this claim is actually what was used to crucify him, to accuse him of blasphemy. And that believing you may have life in his name, by his authority, with him. That's what he wants us to have. When we walk with him, when we talk with him, you know, and in this world, that's a challenge. Because there are times, I suspect all of us who are believers, we go through it and sometimes we just feel God's presence. We might, you know, maybe we wake up early in the morning, see a, see a sunrise, and it's just like, we see the beauty, we see it, and we just like feel it. And then there are other times it feels like God is far away. Um, they're just like, uh, what's missing? God hasn't really left. What's going on is us, and what's going on is our, our world. And what's going on are the trials and temptations of this world. And he's, but this world is temporary. In fact, you know, we think about the story uh, that God tells us about Adam and Eve and how after they sinned and they were separated from him, he's like, why, he, why did he separate them from him? Or why did he kick them out of the garden? One of the reasons, so they couldn't eat of the tree of, of everlasting life. He's like, don't want to live like this forever. <laughs> See, I mean, in one, some way, he was really doing us a favor. We don't want to live this way. Would you, would you like to live un, without any change, just this constant turmoil? We live in this world politically and, and socially and economically and the ups and downs. And, you know, how, how tiring would that be over thousands of years? I can't even picture hundreds of thousands of years. It would, be, it would be exhausting. But that's not what he's promising is more of this. He's promising more of him and his presence. And so as the apostles themselves, in having seen all those other signs that he did, they could not wait when they fully understood it after he had had risen from the grave and he had taught them all about what he was doing and opened their eyes and understanding. They were so happy to go about doing his work and could not wait to be reunited with him. They didn't need, they weren't looking forward to a long life in the flesh. They, most of them knew they weren't going to get it. And, and, and yet they went about joyously being beaten because they were looking forward to something. They had experienced. They had been in His presence. They had been with Him. And they are the ones telling us about why we ought to believe in Him. Because we don't, we don't have their experience, do we? We didn't touch Him. We didn't see Him. But they did. And their lives are really one of the great testimonies of why 
we ought to follow. Because if, if what they experience is just a little portion of what he's telling us to look forward to, and these guys were willing to do anything and have anything done to them so that they could get back together with him, that ought to tell us something about how special it is to be in God's presence. And so he wrote down the Bible. And so I, I, would, I would like to encourage study regularly. We study all the books of the Bible. We, we, in this church, we, we've set up a plan to, you know, every seven years, just, we, will, we will teach every book of the Bible. So if you're here for all the classes, you will have studied every book of the Bible in seven years. And that's a fairly quick pace because there's a lot to learn about the backgrounds and, and history of, of the Bible. But none of that still replaces you and me just sitting down with a Bible reading and letting God's Word work on us. Because it is the power of salvation, he has told us. Not preachers, not, it wasn't even the apostles, not prophets. It is the message of what he has done for us that is the power. And Romans chapter 1 talks about that. So here in John, I just want to, as we end, as we begin this, probably do a handful of these, um, probably uh, some of the passages in John here over this month. Um, John 1, though, really, John deals with who is Jesus really? Who is this Jesus? I mean, lots of people went to him, talked to him, thought he, you know, people called him rabbi, people called him, you know, a prophet, some people called him, you know, uh, a blasphemer and, and, and the devil. I mean, he got called a lot of stuff. A lot of people thought a lot of things about him. John, who was one of those who was closest to him, he was one of those three apostles that he was closer to than the rest, and, and whom, whom, who lived the longest, according to historical records. John started out this gospel telling us who Jesus really is. So I want to read here from uh, John 1. And so if you have Bibles, I'm not going to put it all up there. So if you have Bibles, it would be great if you could open it up there. We're going to just read here the first five verses to start. In the beginning, now, doesn't that just like, starts out exactly like Genesis, doesn't it? It's kind of like he's like, and I don't think that's an accident. I think he is very clearly telling us, listen, if we think back to in the beginning, he was there. He, he, remember what happened in the beginning? What did God say? He spoke and it came into existence. God didn't have to do that. He just spoke and it happened. And what he tells us is in the beginning, Jesus was the word. He's the message that was spoken. And the word was with God. Now, this word, this word, word, is actually a Greek word, logos, which is the term, you know, the first verse I put up there, our, our theme verse for the year, this saying is trustworthy. That word saying is this word, logos. Um, and uh, my, my Bible study software that I have used for the last 20 some years is actually named after this word. Logos. It's actually a fairly complex word. It doesn't just mean like, it's not written word. You know, there's actually the term script or, uh, or there's like grammar in Greek. There's, there's words for just written down letters and words and things like that's not this. This is, this is something more. It's like the saying, the word, the, it means something much more. And it's actually a fairly complex idea in Greek that is hard to put into English. No one word kind of does it justice. We don't really have one that fully fits it. But he was that saying. He was the, the, the words, the message of God. And he says, this message, this word, this saying was with God. And the word was God. So, before anything's even made, he's there. He's not created. It says, he was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. He says, 
In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Now, so he tells us four things really here that I wanted to focus on. That he is the Word, he was with God, he was, he was God, and that he was the maker of every single thing that's been made. Sometimes people get all tossed around with uh, different doctrines and, of men that, you know, try to put Jesus as some, some kind of other created being from God. Um, and, and John is trying to very explicitly with a lot of different sentences, and not just saying it once, but tell us very explicitly, there isn't anything made that has been made that wasn't made by him. He's not anything made. He was the thing that made anything that's made. And, and so he was very explicitly trying to help us understand Jesus isn't created. He's the creator. And so he, he wants us to understand from that message. And so when we think about the message of the cross, we think about even the message that, that Joe read for us about him becoming our high priest, being made like us so he could save us, to take away the power of the devil... Think about it. You ever stop and think about that? And I, I've thought about this before, but as, as he read that passage, I'm thinking, how did, the, how did the devil have power before Jesus died? How could God not save us from the, from the power of the devil before Jesus died? Because what, it, what was the power the devil had? All he had to do was get us to sin once, and he separated us from God. That was his power. And God had to take it away from him, because we couldn't. And so, the message of the cross is one of the maker, the creator, saving those he made. And not, he didn't, he didn't come down and give his life for every created thing, did he? It's not, it's not for the birds, it's not, it's not for the, you know, our dogs, it's not... They don't have that issue. They don't have our issue. They're not made in His image. We are. We sin. I don't know that we would... I don't think God ever places the concept of sin on, on, on animals. I don't think we should. I don't think we do, typically. Animals do what they do. They, they do how, what they, you know... they kind of a, a complex mixture of, of genetics and, and, and you know, kind of built-in desires and things and they do what they do you know I got to, I got to, I got to experience that from my little uh, dachshund this week when I tried to save a duck <laughs> he I don't know how he got a duck but ducks lying in our yard all the time they, they usually run after him and the ducks usually get away without any problem for some reason I saw him out there chewing on a duck and the duck was fighting trying to fight him off and I tried to save him but unfortunately I don't think I did um, but you know I don't I was kind of yell my dog, get away from the duck, stop, stop chewing on the duck. But, but at the end, I'm not, I'm not upset at my dog. My dog, was in, he's doing what he does. He, he, he's a dachshund. He's bred to go after stuff that's on, on the ground. He, that's what he does. You, know, you, don't want other be, you don't want to be other little vermin or, or birds in our yard. <laughs> he will try and, he'll try and get his teeth on you. But, you know, but to humans, he's completely different. And, and, but that, and we understand that. They're not, they're not us. We're, human beings are different. We understand. We can kind of get that. We see that. Now, we look at, at scientists trying to say, oh, no, we're not any different. But, and yet it flies in the face of all of our experience. All of our experience says we're the only creature we've ever come in contact with that has the same kind of, we're trying to think about the past, and not just the past, since we were born, the past from even before we were born and before our grandparents were born. You think my dogs are car caring at all about <laughs> their lineage? No. Do you think they're worried about where they're going? My dogs are, are just worried about making sure I give them food tonight. <laughs> right now they're just kind of curled up warm in a blanket and then they're like, a little while later they'll go, hey, I'm hungry. I want food. <laughs> they don't think much bigger than that. They have, they have some memories of us and they're, and they're close to us, but we're different. We're, we're all like God. 
We are His offspring. Actually, Apostle Paul talks about that in Acts chapter 17 when he was talking to the Greeks uh, at, uh, um, at, on Mars Hill at the Areopagus uh, where they studied, you know, kind of world philosophies all the time. And even they, the Greek philosophers, had said the same thing. We are God's offspring. People have recognized that from the very foundations of humanity. And then what he's telling us is, Jesus is our creator. He's not just some guy. He's not some, you know, guy who had a philosophy that was really good and it was, you know, if you followed it, that's great. No, this is the one who made us, who came to save us. That's what he's trying to help us understand. So we go to the next little section. He says, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. And he says, he came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. John was a witness of the light, wasn't the light. In fact, if you notice that he said, even before John came, and he talks about in verse 5, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. You see, because the devil and the darkness can't overcome God. And what are the, why is that? Because what do they think about when we say... If we were to go through the scriptures and say, okay, here's all the things that describe what God is. Not, not just what he does, but what he actually is, in, in essence. Tells us that he is love, right? He's light. That's why, like in Revelation, it tells us that we don't, when we're with God, he, there won't be any sun. We don't need sun and a moon and stars, you know, won't need a night light. We won't need any of those things. Because in God's presence... We're in the light. And he's saying, that's what he's talking about from the very beginning, that the light of God is never going to be overcome by darkness. We get overcome by darkness. We can struggle in the darkness. But that's why we're not looking for other people in the darkness to help us out of darkness. We need to look at the light to help us overcome the darkness. Kind of like what, uh, um, probably I know a few of you are, are connected with uh, um, some of the people that I am on, on Facebook, and, and one of the things I had seen, I didn't read the whole article, but uh, Ed Sanderson, a preacher in, in California, had, had you know, posted a, a little, I don't know if it was writing or an article about, just about, you know, instead of about fighting the darkness, light a candle. <laughs> instead of, and, and, and it, was, it was kind of about our political, the political and social atmosphere in our country right now, that people look and we keep wanting to call things evil, and we keep wanting to call these evil things as if they, you know, human beings in the 21st century now, the definition of evil is Hitler, right? So everything's Hitler. You know, Obama is Hitler, you know, Trump is Hitler, it's like, we're, we probably misunderstand history if we think these people are Hitler. Um, we may not like them. We may not like even their, who they are all the time. But when we don't really grasp, and, and the way to overcome evil is not to become evil and hateful and, and rageful, but is to light the light, to spread some Peace, spread some kindness, spread some goodness, spread some, some, some soft words. You know, be, be forgiving and, and graceful. That's what we need to be. We need to let our light shine. If this is a dark time, then it's more important that our light shine. And so John wasn't the light that kind of gives the light to us. He was just witness. He was, a, he was there to testify to the whole nation. The light's coming. You need to hear it. And so he went on. He says, the true light, which gives light to everyone, that's how our light shines, right? Because he's the source of the light that shines in us. It's not other people. It's 
It's not other preachers. It's not the apostles. It's not some you know, great theologian. The light shines in us for one reason and one, one alone, and that's God and Jesus Christ. And so he tells us that he was in the world and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and, that, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So he gave everybody who believes in him the right to be a child of God. That's what God, Jesus does for man. He says, if you believe in me, you can be one of his children in his household too. That, that's what Jesus, in essence, was doing for all of us. To allow all of us who are not his biological children to allow us to be adopted into his household, into his family, and to have his inheritance, and to have his everlasting life. And so, you think about why did so many not receive him? Why did so many of his own people, I mean, these were people, the, the people that he came to, Israel in the first century A.D. was a nation looking forward to a Messiah. This was a nation that understood they had, their, they had, the, they had the book of Daniel. They could see the different kingdoms and what God was going to do in different kingdoms. may not have understood every part of it, but in fact, I don't know if everybody's aware of this, that historically when Alexander the Great, who is the third kingdom in, this, in Daniel's story of the three, the statue and the four kingdoms, when Alexander the Great started to flow across uh, the Middle East, after he'd come across from Greece and had taken, you know, what today is Turkey, he came down into Israel and the priests spoke with him and received him gladly and told him that God said you were coming and showed him and read him those things. In fact, Israel is one of the few countries that essentially got left intact as he swept across, across to, to Persia and down into India. And in, in fact, tells a historic loop, Bible didn't tell us this, but Alexander the Great told them, apparently, that he had actually had some dreams. And God seemed to have maybe said something or, or given him some kind of a, a sense of what was, he was doing, uh, that he understood that he left Israel alone. You know, he basically took away the people who had been persecuting them and, or, and gave them essentially a, a free reign. For quite a while, but the uh, when he talks about a people, they didn't receive him. It's like these were his people looking forward to him. They knew he was coming. They could see it was coming in this Roman Empire who had you know, overthrown the Greeks, and he, they were waiting. And yet most of them didn't receive him. You think, why is that? You're waiting for a Savior. The Savior comes, and you don't like that one. Because of what man's problem typically is, we want to be saved the way we want to be saved. We want help the way we want help. How many times have you ever tried to help somebody, and somebody comes to you and says, you know, oh, can you help me with this? Added? Yeah, sure, you know, hey, let me get... No, no, I don't want help that way. I get this all the time. I get phone calls. Hey, you know, we're stuck. We don't have, you know, really in trouble. You know, it's like, hey, you know, it's like, can I get you this or help you? No, this. Oh, no, no, I don't need those things. You know, <laughs> it's always very specific. I need this. I need you to come bring me money for the motel. <laughs> That's what most of them are. Um, and it's unfortunate because I, I want to help as much as I possibly can. We obviously don't, can't help put everybody up at motels every night. But they don't want other kinds of help, they only want the help they want. It's the chat. And so even when you have people who really are in a bad way, and I say, you know, hey, I, I know somebody, I'm pretty close to somebody over at the Boise Rescue Mission. Hey, they'll have a bed and get you a bed over there. No, no, I don't want that. I'd rather sleep on the street. 
What's wrong with that? What's wrong with the picture? I only want help the way I want help. And that's the exact reason why humans have a tough time getting God's help is because we often want it the way we want it. We want to keep doing what we want to do, but we'd like somebody over there who could just protect us from that, give us some fire insurance so we can have a wonderful life when this isn't over. And that's not really what God's doing. He's, he's not an insurance broker or even the insurance agent or the insurance company. God is saying, I am offering you to come into my house, but you have to take it my way. You have to follow me. You have to listen to me. You have to walk with me. That's his, the one essential thing that he requires. Now, he asks us to grow and, and become more like him, but the thing is, we have to do it his way. We have to basically humble ourselves enough to give up that sense of, I want it the way I want it, when I want it, how I want it, which is typical of human beings. And so, John tells us all about, he testifies to him, and he tells everybody about him, you, there's the Lamb of God, and he tells us that Jesus gave them authority to be his children. And then he goes on, starting verse 14, and the Word became flesh. So the Word already existed, right? And that's what he's, he's very clearly telling us. Jesus existed before anything was even made that was made. He existed, and then he became flesh. So one of the things that makes Jesus very different from other humans, even though he becomes fully human, right? He's born just like every other baby. He's raised up just like every other baby. He died in the flesh just like every other human who's killed. But what makes him really different from all other humans, because there are even other humans that, that ascended. There are even other humans that didn't die. What makes him different is he existed prior to the flesh. That's not true of any other human. Humans are created in the flesh first. Our spirit was created with part of the flesh. I don't know how, and I don't think any of us understand, I don't think anybody has ever understood how exactly that all works. That's part of God's stuff. But he said, even the scriptures tell us that the flesh is first in the spirit. So our spiritual life is going to be second. But he had a spiritual life even before the fleshly one. And he chose to leave it. can't even imagine what that would have been like for him. To have lived in this world of trials and darkness having after what he had experienced. But that's what he did because he had to remove the power of Satan from getting us to all sin. And so, starting here in verse 14... The Word became flesh, dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father. Now, when Jesus walked on the face of the earth, did people look at Him and go, wow, that guy's special? No. In fact, Isaiah prophesied that He wouldn't look any different from anybody else. In fact, He wouldn't look... Nobody said, wow, that guy is incredibly handsome, the most handsome person ever. He wasn't that. He wasn't the strongest person ever. He wasn't the you know, biggest person ever. He wasn't the handsomest person ever. He, wasn't, he was just a person. He, was, he fit in with the crowd. He was pretty average, normal to a Jewish man. And nobody thought anything special of him. His glory was not something you could see with the eyes. It was only something you could have seen after you actually were near him. And had felt it. Because when he talks about grace and truth, can we see with our eyes grace? Is that, a, is, that a, is that a physical quality? What about truth? Is truth something you can just see with your eyes? You got witness testimonies, right? But what, what do police say? Is every testimony the same? No. In fact, do you know if they, if they something happens and then they... Uh, you know, sit and you know, investigate it, and they, they ask everybody what they saw. And every single, let's see, 10 people, and their testimony is identical. What does that tell? What's the cop thinking? Something's wrong. 
<laughs> Somebody made up a story <laughs> here because people just don't do that. Which ought to also give us a little sense of why the Gospels are not mere copies of one another. They're four different people writing what happened in, in, their, in the words God gives them, but in a different picture of it, a little different perspective of it for each of them. But he dwelt among us. They saw the glory as the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. That was the glory they saw. This guy, could you, could you imagine how they felt? Do you remember what the apostles thought when Jesus, you know, would have like a, a prostitute touching him, and she'd come in, you know, and, you know, crying over him, touching him. And what would, what would the rest of the apostles have done prior to actually being influenced by Jesus with that prostitute? Would they have been kind to her? Would they have let them, her touch them? No, they wouldn't have. Just like most of the other Jews wouldn't have had that, let them do that at all. They saw Jesus do things they wouldn't do. What did, what did they all think, or probably all thought it, we know Peter said it, when Jesus got down and, like a slave, started washing their feet? Doesn't seem right. Here, here, our master, wait a second, this is, this is, a, this is like, a, it's like your mind's getting blown, right? They're, they're, it's like you think, okay, the masters do this stuff, the slaves do this stuff, and the master starts, he gets down, gets a bowl of water, and he, and he starts washing your feet. You know, this isn't right. And Peter says so, because he's that guy who's willing to say what he thinks. I'm sure most of the other guys thought the same stuff. But we see that most of the apostles kind of kept their mouths shut, didn't say anything. Peter got in more trouble because he often said it. But they're like, no, this isn't right. And he goes, you don't understand what I'm doing right now. They didn't. They didn't get it. It took them a while. It took a lot of things to have happened, him, him dying, his resurrection, his ascension, the, the, the day of Pentecost when the, the Holy Spirit came upon them, before all of those things began, to, I understand that even as an apostle, I'm just a slave. I'm just a servant. Um, and so he goes on, he says, John bore witness about him, cried out, this was he of whom I said, he who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. So Jesus was about six months younger than John, came after him, but he really was before him. He's not really talking in terms of you know, chronological age, though they'd say it still holds true. What he's really talking about is rank. John came first. Typically, the guy who comes first is kind of the greatest, right? And then the people who follow behind him are kind of like, you know, secondary. Think about Elijah, Elijah and then you'll get Elisha, and Elisha's kind of, you know, or even Moses, then Joshua. Now, they both do great things, but one kind of follows the other. We think of the first one as the greatest one. In this case, we got John and Jesus. We got John going first and then Jesus coming behind him. But he says, listen, he's before me. His rank is higher than mine. He came after me, but no, he's above me. Um, which is why he even himself didn't want to baptize him. He's like, you should be baptizing me. I don't want to baptize you. And Jesus had to tell him, no, I've come here for this reason. You, you do what you've been called to do. And he did. But he says, this was whom he said, he who comes after me ranks before me. He said in verse 16, for from his fullness we have all received Grace upon grace, for the, the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side. He has made Him known. And this is the testimony of John. When the, news, or when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask Him, Who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked Him, What then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, No. By the way, the prophet is a reference to Moses promising another prophet like him who would come and bring another law. 
And so that's what they were asking. Are you the Elijah that you know, Malachi talks about? Are you the prophet that Moses talks about? No, no. He answered, no. And he, they said to him, who are you? We need to give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. That reference is, by the way, is, is, the, is the idea, the image of a king who's coming. What do we do for uh, dignitaries? We, we, roll, we call rolling out the red car carpet. When somebody rolls out a red carpet for them to walk in on, what is done under the red carpet that's laid over? We get rid of pebbles, we get rid of rocks. We don't, we don't, not, we don't want a carpet that's full of lumps that people can trip over. So what's the last thing we want the dignitary to do? Walk in and stumble and trip and fall. So we make the path. In fact, what straight means is really smooth. It doesn't mean straight this way. It means it's straight this way. There's no, nothing to stumble upon. That's what's being referred to in the image going all the way back to Isaiah. And it's something we all do for... Every country has always done it for other foreign dignitaries. We give them special entrances. And we take away anything that you know, might cause them to stumble or, or look bad. That's what he, John is saying he was doing for Jesus. He was preparing the way for this great king to arrive. Now, now, it says they had been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him then, why are you baptizing? If you are neither the Christ nor Elijah nor the prophet. Notice that they did expect baptizing. They just didn't expect it from everybody. <laughs> John answered them, I baptize with water, but among you stands one you do not know, even he who comes after me, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to unite. These things took place in Bethany across the Jordan where John was baptizing. And so he says, there's another coming after me. I'm just baptizing here with some water. His baptism is going to be a lot bigger than mine. He says, the next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So when he says, that's an imagery. This is one of the things that why we have to ultimately learn the passages all through the Old Testament and things. Because when he said, look, the Lamb of God, what would every Jew have thought? The Lamb of God, the very first thing probably coming to their head is the Passover. The Passover Lamb. That had, was slaughtered every year. There were also the Day of Atonement, you know, the animals that were sacrificed for them. But they're thinking, oh, he's saying, look, there's the real Lamb of God. All of those, those lambs and the, the bulls and all the other animals slaughtered were just a, a shadow to help us understand how wonderful, how pure this Lamb of God was. And so he said, look. Um, and then uh, John bore witness, I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove. Actually, I skipped a verse here. Verse 30, this is he of whom I said, after me comes a man who ranks before me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptized with water that he might be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness, I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and borne witness that this is the Son of God. Now, you might already, must be already aware, when you study the scriptures, that John and Jesus are, are cousins. And John actually had testified in the womb that Jesus was special. But John, as he grew up, didn't know, and whether he saw, and I'm sure he saw his cousin from time to time. They would have all got, been gathered around Jerusalem many times a year. And so he probably knew his cousin, probably somewhat aware of him, but didn't really, he didn't know that was the Christ. Even John didn't know Jesus was the one until the Spirit of God, he saw the Spirit of God descend upon him and, and rest on him. And that's when he goes, oh, that's the one. And that's how he could tell everybody, there's the Lamb of God. Turned out to be his cousin. He says, I have seen and borne witness that this is the Son of God. That was the testimony. The Lamb of God to take away the sin of the world. He is the Son of God. You're going to see that all through the... When you read through the book of John, 
almost all the stories John gives us kind of have something at the end going, oh, then he's a prophet, or then he's the son of God, or he's the Messiah, or they all, re everybody in the stories realize, oh, that's him. He's giving us all of these stories to help us understand that John isn't the only one who recognized he was special. That people, you know, from, from the, you know, Samaritan woman at a well to a blind man begging in Jerusalem were touched and influenced and experienced him and went, oh, wow, this guy's special. And they, and they believed. And they, and they followed. We're going to, all of us, you know, as we meet God in judgment, we will give an account. Do we really believe? Do we walk after? Do we follow? Did we really trust Him? That's what God's looking for. Not perfection. Not without stumbling. He understands we're... we're human beings who, who are, are torn and you know, tempted and tried, but he asks us to be committed to his way. 